Hi, I have a question for you. What's worth knowing? So this is a question that I've, uh, I've ran into throughout this week's, this week's wandering um, research. And this week's topic was cloud technology. So I researched all around um, the history, what it is today, and what it's going to be in the future. And I came across this interesting question that I kept on asking myself throughout the research because I kept on finding a common, a common pattern in what I was finding in cloud, but also in other areas related or unrelated to it. And this post I've written, you should go definitely check it out. I'm gonna, in this video, I'm gonna give you a snapshot of what's in the post, um, give you a brief overview of what I've written, and then um, expect you to go read it. So uh, the overview of the post is basically me diving into the history of cloud, um, talking a bit about the present day of where it is today, but before that actually more importantly talking about the, the concept of utility and how that's actually basically leaked into this cloud technology era, into the era that we're in today. Um, then I talk about in the future how the cloud could potentially disappear and then I get to um, the final point within the post, which is what's worth knowing. And that's the more philosophical idea and question that I kept on asking myself throughout this post. So without further ado, let's talk a bit about the post. For this video, I'm gonna skip over some of the history, um, but there is a point that I wanna talk about, which is utility. So in the industrial revolution, there were uh, a lot of companies that built products, right? And building these products, they had to not only build the product, but they had to focus on creating the energy because there weren't as many en energy providers back in that time. So people had to build their factories close to rivers. They had to have half of their employees throwing coal and coal burning furnaces to create energy, to create whatever products they were making, could be chairs, whatever it was. And it's interesting to see this, this idea of utility that was kind of born out of that revolution, which is once we've had these people that would specialize in creating energy, quote unquote energy providers, they would sell that energy off to these companies. So these companies could focus solely on what matters most to them and what's highest leverage, which is focusing fully on the final product that they're going to sell to their consumers. And they're not focusing on all the things that basically make that product come to fruition, which is the energy that they need to build it. And it's amazing. I mean, this is, a, this is a kind of a surprise to me because I knew about cloud previously and I knew about some of the details within it, but I never looked at it from this lens. And maybe a surprise to you as well is that looking at this utility concept, it's almost identical to what's happening today within the world that we live in, where we have all these companies, basically every company in every industry needs some utility from our cloud providers today. So a cloud provider, a brief explanation, basically provides two main things. They, they provide a shitload of stuff because most companies do, but the, the two main things and the two main reasons they exist is for storage and for processing information. And it's interesting to think that all these companies would have to have a dedicated IT team that focused on storing the data and processing and running compute on the data. But once we've had these cloud providers create this utility and they've basically figured out a way to sell this to you um, when you need it. It's, it's, it's the same thing as energy providers back in the industrial revolution where we have cloud providers providing storage and compute. In the past, they provided energy for factories to run. So it's amazing how, how history does repeat itself. It just repeats itself in different ways. And that really kind of, and that was super interesting to me and I loved kind of coming across that and having that light bulb go off in my head. I'll give you kind of a brief overview of cloud in this video. I've explained it more in the post, um, but today's current cloud, basically you can think of it as just a bunch of big black boxes. Imagine them looking like creepy fridges. And in those creepy fridges, they have a bunch of servers that are just racks and racks of servers. And the purpose of these servers, like I said, are to store information that you're creating and to run compute on it, to process the information, to do something with it. And when I say compute, it's an example could be to encode a video or to resize an image. And there's thousands of things you can do with this, 
but there's just a few things that I've just explained here that are relevant to that. And then storage is basically if you have an image or you have some text or you have a video or whatever you want to save it, you don't want to save it on your device, you can save it off into the cloud. And the cloud is basically just a massive warehouse full of these creepy fridges all over the world. And there are different types of clouds. There's different f flavors of clouds that people like to use. Um, most companies use hybrids or they will, go, they will use hybrids. And a hybrid is basically a combination between private and public. So a private cloud is basically, this is my cloud, no one else can play with it. And people do have this misconception that a private cloud means that the, like, the warehouse is on the company's premises. So it's their own warehouse that they're kind of taking care of. But that's not necessarily the case most times and it's not necessarily going to be the case in the future. Because these public cloud providers, like I told you, the energy providers, these cloud providers, these are massive companies, Amazon being the biggest, Azure and then Google. And these companies have specialized in providing this energy. So why would you take that from them and do that for them? And I know there are reasons for doing that, but over time those reasons become less and less of a reason. So, hence of sensitive sensitivity of data, security, etc. So more and more what's happening with these private um, cloud clouds is that you're basically getting a, se a segregated off piece of that public cloud and that's yours and you can plug directly into it and it's your private piece of cloud. So in that, that massive warehouse and all these warehouses everywhere else, if you say I want private, then basically they take one of those creepy fridges, they separate that creepy fridge from all the other creepy fridges, and they say this is yours and no one else can touch it and it's yours to play with and it's your virtual playground. And then public cl cloud is basically what most people are doing where you go in and say I would like some of your data and some of some of your storage and some of your compute and then you basically play within the warehouse and you share resources with everyone else. No one has access to your data but you're just using all the same physical fridges as everyone else. And uh, there's other pieces to this so there's multiple services that are provided within it and I won't dive too in, too much into the detail here and I, I avoid it within the post semi. I, I talk about it some in the post but not too much because it's not the purpose of the post. Um, so I've talked about public, private, and hybrid. A hybrid is basically a combination between the two so you do a bit of private, bit of public. Um, and within that, there are different types of control levels you can have as a, cust as, a, as a consumer. So if I'm a cloud provider and I'm giving you some storage and some compute, you can basically say how much control you want over that creepy fridge that I'm talking about. And uh, the, the kind of the traditional three are infrastructure as a service, uh, platform as a service, and software as, as a service. And each of these, if you look at it as a spectrum, this has the most control and this has the least control. So infrastructure as a service has the most, software as a service has the least. And I'll explain these because we uh, techies like to name things horribly and be convoluted with our acronyms and our definitions. Um, so as a service basically means on demand. So all of these offerings come as you need them, when you need them. So. For instance, if I have a website and I have five people coming per minute to my website, I'd probably, I'd probably be fine with one creepy small fridge somewhere in, in the cloud. But if my website started to get five million people per minute, then maybe I would need a bigger fridge or I would need multiple fridges, creepy fridges, um, to kind of deal with that demand that's coming to my website. And the good thing about these cloud providers is basically as long as your uh, credit card is big enough and you have enough money in your pocket, um, you can basically deal with this demand as needed. So they, they give you more fridges the more people that visit your website, they give you less fridges for the less people that visit your website. So they kind of, it fluctuates as demand as needed, so as a service. Um, so infrastructure, basically that means that you, you have the most control, you basically do everything except for uh, the actual hardware and dealing with the building and all that stuff. You get to play with everything mostly as yourself. Uh, platform as a service is a basically um, you get building blocks from the cloud provider and then you can build on top with the building blocks given to you. Uh, an example of that would be using Java or Python to build applications on top of the cloud. And then SaaS is what most of us know about, most of consumers. And these are basically Netflix, Spotify, Gmail, all of these, all of these consumer applications are given to you but they're hosted in using the cloud. 
Um, so those are the three main ones. And if you're really interested in this stuff and you want to hear what the coolest kids are talking about these days, uh, serverless computing is kind of a new phenomenon. So you can either look up serverless computing, you can look up uh, event-driven architecture, or you can look up uh, function as a service. And look up any three of those terms and you'll get to the same place. Uh, that's kind of what the, the future holds for us when it comes to cloud. So in a nutshell, that is cloud. So we have how the different flavors of how the clouds are provided, hybrid, public, private, and then we have the different services or the amount of control you have over these things. And those are the ones I just, just described as a service. So now we have the basics out of the way. That is what cloud is. It is basically a warehouse somewhere that gives you storage and compute and it does it in different ways. So now I want to talk about how this thing we just explained could potentially most likely disappear over time. And if it doesn't, it won't disappear, but it'll become less significant in our lives. And the reason I say that is this new concept of pushing the cloud, which is out in the distance, closer to you. So they're expanding the cloud to you and it's coming to the edge. And that's what people call edge computing. And this whole edge computing concept came about for many different reasons, but some of the largest reasons are the number of devices that we have. So we have devices all over the place, right? And when most of us think about devices, we think of phones, we think of laptops, we think of tablets, we think of things that we, a user, touch and play with. So we, that's what we think of as the device. But that is nowhere near the, um, the number of devices that we're going to have because that would be limited to 7 billion people in the world or maybe 7 billion people have two or three devices and then you get into a couple, I don't know, 100 billion. But an interesting thing is to think about what are the devices in the future that are going to be smart because most devices that are being created today and that will be created going forward will be connected to the internet and they will have some sort of intelligence embedded within them. And these devices could be cars, they could be shoes, they could be fridges, they could be um, shirts, they could be I don't know, tractors, uh, robots in factories, sensors all over the place, cameras, etc. All these things are going to be connected. And with all of these devices comes the importance of speed. So when most people think of edge compute, when they think of all these devices, they're, they usually default to the worry of saying, we're not going to have enough space to store all this data. And that's actually not the problem. I mean, it, it could be a problem eventually, but... Uh, most likely it won't. Uh, and I, in the post, I link to an interesting article around uh, how data is actually being encoded into DNA, and that just like astronomically increases our ability to store data. But go to the post to read that. Um, so edge computing, yeah. So the, the big reason speed is a concern here is that all these devices that we are using and that we'll, we will use in the future, they have a really, really tight feedback loop that's important for them to run um, real time because a lot of these devices will need to act quickly and they can't just wait for a response from a data center or from a creepy fridge farm really, really far away. So with these devices, there's a really tight feedback loop with three main things that I actually pulled from an interesting presentation I highly recommend you go watch um, from Peter Levine from A16Z. And I'll play a quick clip here. The other thing is that we are going to move to a world of data-centric programming. It's kind of interesting in the same way that, you know, I believe that cloud disaggregates into this new model. We're teaching everyone to code now, and we're teaching everyone to code logic. That is if, then, else, and that's what everyone's learning how to code. Well, when you deal with data, we don't use if, then, and else. We're going to be using data to actually solve problems, and the next generation of coders will be more mathematicians and data analysts as opposed to if, then, elsers. And then here, he basically talks for about 20 to 25 minutes talking about how the cloud will disappear and why it will. Um, and in there, he speaks about this feedback loop I've told you about, and there's three things. So it, there's sense, infer, and act. So sense is you're a sensor, so you're a camera, you're um, an accelerometer, you're a depth sensor, a radar sensor, whatever kind of sensor, and you sense the world around you. Then you have to infer from that data because the data that's coming into these sensors is basically unreadable to humans and it's usually raw and really un understandable. And what these sensors have usually will most will have embedded within it and them is some sort of machine learning algorithm. And that machine learning algorithm will have to infer from this data what's relevant and what's not, and get rid of what's not and keep what's relevant. 
once it decides what's relevant and infers on that, then it has to act. And once it makes that action, it's going to come back to the sensing piece. So uh, an example that people like to use for this kind of little small loop is um, self, self-driving cars. And they, the reason they like to use these is because it's kind of the most obvious and the most easily understandable for most people. So if you have a self-driving car and you have a sensor on top, you have a camera or a LiDAR or whatever it is, it's sensing the world around it as it's driving. And as it's driving, it needs to see what's happening and then it has to infer from all that data what is relevant and what's not. And after it infers the world around it, then it needs to make an action. And if there's a little old lady walking across the street, it needs to know to stop before that little old lady gets hit by the car. And all that has to happen extremely fast And by doing so, that data can't be sent to a creepy fridge farm, have them process the data, have them infer from what's relevant, and then send back an action to the car. The car has to do all that by itself without going back and forth. So all these devices that we're going to have embedded everywhere around us, in us, on us, whatever, all these devices need to be smart enough to do that small feedback loop without having to send the data back. So... That's, that's, that's interesting there in itself. And this information, like I said, isn't going to be human understandable, at least not immediately. This information is made from machines, mostly for machines. It's not made from humans for humans. And that's, that's the interesting, another thing about this, this data that's going to be created from all these devices. Two more things on this edge compute concept, and then we'll go to the last point. So the first is um, fog. So a fog is another term you'll come across when looking up edge computing. And basically the high level understanding of fog is basically you have cloud. So cloud providers and imagine cloud being the highest, farthest away. So you have all these really big creepy free fridges um, in the cloud. And then below that you'll have a couple million smaller fridges closer to you. So this is the fog piece. So the fog has moved down. Imagine the fog moving from clouds to closer to the planet. So you have fog here, and then you have edge devices, which will be all around you. So think far away cloud, um, semi close to you fog, and then really close to you or on you at um, edge devices. And this fog piece is just smaller, creepy fridges that do the similar things that these big fridges do, but closer to you and less costly. So that's fog. And then the other thing I came across, which is really interesting and kind of connected with me in my mind is that the concept of machine learning on all of these edge devices. So think of the cloud, so the far off place, being the mothership, right? So this mothership does all the learning and it does all, it's like the brains of, of the collective consciousness of the world of devices. So we have all of these trillions and billions of devices around the world. Their collective consciousness is stored in the mothership brain. And What could potentially happen here is that all these edge devices have machine learning algorithms on them, but these devices on their own, they're not smart enough to learn and iterate and improve by themselves. But what they can do is they can be sent these learned models that are distributed out to them from the brain and the mothership. They can act on these learning at models so they can do things with them and they can maybe collect some data from their experience and kind of send that send those learnings and send that data back, whichever data is relevant to the mothership. And what the mothership will do is, is she or he will collect all of, this, um, all of this relevant data and all these learnings from these devices back to the mothership. And once, she, once it collects it, then it can learn upon all of that, those learnings and all of that relevant data, and then create new models that are better enhanced, improved, and more accurate and then distribute those learnings and those models back out to the devices. So it's the collective kind of mesh connected consciousness, the collective consciousness of all these devices that are all kind of learning simultaneously together and and the sea is rising and rising and rising and becoming more and more intelligent. And it's just, it's so sci-fi. It's not, it is sci-fi. It's slightly creepy, Um, but creepy in a cool way because imagine in a world where your devices act on your behalf without any of your conscious input. And conscious meaning you saying device do this, device do that, thing do this, thing do that. Instead, what it's doing is it's, it's kind of passively collecting information about you, realizing what is good, what's bad, um, what's healthy, what's unhealthy, what's um, good for your happiness, what's un- not good for your happiness, and all these things. And it's basically nudging you in different directions to improve your life. 
And that is creepy because it could go wrong, um, but it also could go right. And I think that not enough people are focusing on the right piece of this. Uh, and there's another video I'll link here, another one from A16Z, because A16Z, I, I appreciate a lot of what they do because they basically give out free education and free insights to what they potentially think the future is, obviously, for their business and their startups. But still, it's, it's pretty helpful and insightful, and they link out to a lot of interesting things. So, another video I'll show here. All right. How do we build customized foods? And in particular, how do we get to the protein in these meals? So one super intriguing possibility for where the protein comes from is what's called lab-grown or engineered or slaughter-free meats. So here's the basic idea. We take a tissue sample from a pig or a cow. We harvest its stem cells and we put those stem cells in a bioreactor, in a nutrient bath where when cells are in a healthy environment, they'll do what cells do. They'll multiply. If we can do that, we have this intriguing possibility that we could literally grow the meat that we want without raising and slaughtering an animal. And in this lecture, he basically talks about what is one future scenario that could potentially happen with the plethora of breakthroughs that we're having in different areas of science and technology. Okay, enough of the tech. So I've talked about cloud, talked about edge computing, talked about fog, um, talked about the basics. Go to the post if you want more because I've, I've really articulated out kind of my thoughts, my understanding and my learnings from this. And the last piece I want to talk about is what's worth knowing. So I asked you this question in the beginning of the video and I'm asking it again at the end and the reason I'm asking this and the reason I found myself asking this to myself is this common thread I found throughout this entire process of learning about the cloud and also learning about the utility of cloud and the common thread that I found here is abstraction and when I say abstraction I mean in the in the sense of knowledge so you're abstracting knowledge away from yourself and you're you're outsourcing that to someone else and that's important and that's why we progress so much in the society that we're in today because we are specialized and we're capitalistic so we outsource what we don't want to know or don't want to do to someone that will specialize in that area and will buy that product or service from them for example you i wouldn't have a phone i wouldn't probably have a very nice home um, i wouldn't have bread or clothing or all these things because i don't know how to make all of them and if I did, they'd probably be a lot worse than they are today. Um, and there are downfalls to this. We all know that capitalism and specialism have downfalls, but they also have a lot of benefits. And th that's the reason why we have so many great toys and tools and experiences and leisure time, because we have the ability to abstract that complexity away and give it to someone else to figure out or do because they specialize in it. But this question I've found myself asking is how far is too far? How far is it for us to abstract away too much? And that led me to ask the question of what is worth knowing? So what am I willing not to abstract? What, what am I willing not to outsource to someone else to know how to do? What, am, what do I need to know? Um, and that's an interesting question to ask because then it leads you into asking questions around um, what are fundamental pieces of knowledge that everyone should know? and what makes a well-rounded human. Um, there's an interesting quote, actually. I will, I'll, I'll put it right here, actually. I'll put it in front of me. Now, this quote is obviously nowhere near accurate for most humans, um, but it's, it's an interesting kind of way to think about it. And after asking this question, I basically thought to myself, what's a, what's a long list of things that I'm unwilling to outsource and unwilling to abstract away? What's worth knowing for me and how do I define worth? Um, and there are some universal answers to this for everyone and I think those universal answers are more meta and they're not very concrete. The more meta ones are kind of uh, critical thinking, learning how to learn, first principles thinking, ways of going about life. Um, but I'm curious to know, what do you define as worth knowing? And I'd love to see kind of what you think that is, and I'd love for you to post that below so I could, you know, maybe incorporate that into my list, even though that my list is ridiculously long and probably will never be achieved in a lifetime. Um, I, still have to, I still have to put it down. And if you're interested, I guess I'll list out a few things that on my list. I won't list them all out, but I basically bucketed them into three segments. So one is uh, survival, one is kind of economics and the other one is around relationships 
So the survival piece is I want to know how to grow my own food. I want to know how to um, build a semi comfortable shelter. I want to know some of these survival things um, just in case. Uh, the other economical piece is around kind of what's, what's monetizable, what's important for contributing to society in my eyes. And that's um, the basics of uh, science, of biology, of physics, of chemistry. Um, that is the basics of mathematics. That's the basics of computer science. Uh, that's some more fundamental things around um, writing and reading. So those are some of those pieces in the economical piece. Actually, some more on the economics because I, I want to bring these up as well, as, and I think they're quite important, is um, the fundamental historical ideas. And I've recently kind of got on this kick from Messine to Lab because I'm going through his series of books, is focusing on not new ideas and new books and new concepts all the time, but spending a good amount of time focusing on the old ideas that have lasted. So looking back on history and understanding history more is something important to me that I want to kind of get better at. Um, so that's another one. And lastly, relationships. So the relationship piece is quite important because I feel like if you cover survival, you cover kind of the economical piece, then you need to focus on your your happiness with others and focusing on relationships. And for me, that's uh, meditation, that's storytelling, that is uh, emotional kind of stability, that is emotional connection with yourself, that is social awareness. All these different things are things that I want to learn more about and improve on. Um, so that's part of my list. I have a much longer list. But like I said, my question to you, what's worth knowing? And when I say worth knowing, I want you to define worth. What is worth to you? And list out some of the things that you want to know or that you're unwilling to let others uh, take away from you or abstract that complexity away from you. So, cloud technology. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, if you enjoyed it, let me know. I, uh, it's always good to get feedback. If you didn't, let me know. It's always good to get feedback. Uh, if you're interested in my newsletter, feel free to subscribe. And if you have any suggestions, let them, let them rip. I'll check them out. And uh, yeah, I hope this is helpful. And internet, I'll see you next time.